All right, we'll go ahead and get started in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Free us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Grace Jesus, our Lord, for thine the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Okay, so we are in week three. Uh, talking about uh, St. Augustine's Confession. Um, last week, we went over uh, chapters one or books one and two. Uh, and this week, we're going to go over uh, books uh, three and four. So book three, for those of you who read it, or even for those of you who maybe didn't get a chance to read it, we see in book three that uh, St. Augustine moves. He's going from uh, his hometown, the Gasti, to uh, Carthage. So Carthage is sort of like this, um, kind of like a big city, uh, whereas where he's from is kind of like a, a small place or whatever. And um, he's about 18 years old. And uh, his reasons for leaving was that he was studying to be a lawyer. So you find him sort of actually in a pretty similar situation to lots of, you know, like college students even nowadays, right? He's away from home. He's on his own in a large city. He's doing well in school. He has an active social life and he goes to plays. Uh, he says that he falls in love, but he doesn't say with who. Uh, but most people that when they read this, they assume that it's the person that he ends up uh, living with for a number of years, I think almost 20 years, he ends up living with this lady. Um, he says, he talks about himself as a, uh, like what type of uh, relationship partner he was. He says that he was a jealous person, a suspicious person, a fearful person, an angry person and a contentious romantic partner. Uh, so it's fascinating for me to see like someone, you know, like St. Augustine be really upfront and honest with his shortcomings. He seems, I don't know, like a basically a pretty regular 18, 19 year old person who's just trying to kind of make their way in the world. If you remember from last week, uh, I mentioned that he doesn't really like uh, fiction. He was talking about in school, I don't really like fiction because he finds it strange and wrong that we maybe weep about uh, the fate of someone who doesn't really exist, but we don't weep about our own sins. He continues a bit sort of along the same line here in this chapter, when he talks about uh, how he sort of gets interested in watching theater, or watching plays. Uh, specifically, he gets interested in watching tragedies. Okay. He says the reason that he likes it is he likes to feel like pity for the characters when really bad, miserable things happen to them. And he thinks to himself, you know, well, that's kind of weird. Don't we all hate feeling miserable in real life? And don't we also hate mm, seeing other people suffer? Or most of the time we hate <laughs> seeing other people suffer. So why do we love watch suffer, watching people suffer on stage? And so St. Augustine, he finds this irrational. Uh, he finds it irrational that the feelings I experience uh, in a theater, for some reason, that's good for me, but in real life, it's bad. So he finds that irrational. So he says that irrationality is actually proof of how evil it is. And while he was into the plays, he says, I wanted only to hear stories and imaginary legends of sufferings, which as it were, scratched me on the surface. Yet like the scratches of fingernails, they produced inflamed spots, pus and repulsive sores. That was my kind of life. So he was saying, this is, you know, this is kind of like, that was his life. Those are the things that he was enjoying at the time. It actually made me sort of think about uh, the question for myself in, in modern times. Probably not too many of you, I don't know, but not too many of you are probably uh, going to too many uh, plays. But uh, all of us or many of us are probably consuming media, right? Lots of media. Does the, the tragedy, the heartbreak, the, the loss that we see happening in the media that we consume numb us to reality? Okay, and I think on some level it does. Uh, so that's something sort of to, to, to keep in mind and be aware of that uh, constantly seeing, you know, people being hurt, constantly seeing uh, violence, constantly seeing, seeing things that should be really jarring to us in real life. When we see it constantly to us in the media, it sort of numbs us to when we see it in real life. When we see it in real life, well, I, you know, I've seen this before a hundred times in a movie or on YouTube or whatever. So it's important to, to recognize, I think the same thing that St. Augustine says about the tragedy is sort of applies to us uh, now. He mentions also actually during this time that he went to church and even in church, uh, he found a girl that he thought was pretty and he was lusting after her at church. 
he tried to start actually start a relationship with her at church. So it just kind of shows the place that he was in during this phase of life. Uh, it also shows that it's a common thing that um, that we are uh, sort of attacked by the devil, even when I'm trying to do something good, right? I'm trying to go to church and all of a sudden he gets attacked uh, by lustful thoughts uh, towards some girl that he kind of sees at church. He also talks about uh, something really interesting. He talks about this group of students that were at school with him in Carthage. And he they had like, it was like a little gang uh, and they, they even had a name. The name of the gang was the Wreckers. Uh, and basically more or less, if you read it, it's really cool. I'll, I'll read you a quote uh, from the book, but most, most like more or less, these were uh, bullies that hazed freshmen basically in his uh, law school in, in, in Carthage. It says, the wreckers used wantonly to persecute shy and unknown freshmen. Their aim was to persecute them by mockery and so to feed their own malevolent amusement. And so these were his friends. These were St. Augustine's friends. And he talks about how these people were the ones that he kind of uh, hung out with. But he does mention there is like sort of a little bit of a, maybe like a glimmer of hope or, or, or light at the end of the tunnel. tunnel. Uh, he says, even though he was friends with these people, he disagreed with what they did. He didn't like that they would bully people and he didn't take part in the bullying, but he never really said, you know, you guys, we should stop or whatever like that. But he just, for his part, he would just try to kind of be quiet. So at the very least, maybe he, he wasn't a part of this. So that was kind of a good thing. So after, um, after uh, some time in Carthage, he has a really important turning point in his life. He reads this book called Hortensius by Cicero. Cicero is a famous philosopher. So this book actually is completely lost to us. We don't know what it says. We don't know what it's about, except for what St. Augustine says about it. Um, St. Augustine tells us that the purpose of the book was to argue against the position that philosophy is useless okay so there were some people who were arguing is that the idea the concept of philosophy is useless and it doesn't need lead to happiness and so cicero is arguing he's replying back to this letter from hortensius he's replying that this anti-philosophical opinion can only be judged by philosophy since in and of itself it's a philosoph philosophical statement so it's very like uh interesting uh philosophical uh, argument that cicero is making and saint augustine really likes it he reads the book uh, when he was, like I said, about 18 years old, while he's studying to be uh, a speaker, a lawyer, uh, someone who has like a, uh, his, his life is about rhetoric, his life is about the spoken word. Uh, but this book uh, argues that the pursuit of truth through philosophy is the route to a happy life. And that, that phrase, the pursuit of truth through philosophy is the route to a happy life, it moved him deeply, affected him a lot, St. Augustine. And he says in the book, he says, for the first time, he longed for the immoral immortality of wisdom with an incredible ardor in my heart. Okay, so he's like, now I want to obtain wisdom because now I feel like the wisdom, wisdom is the way to happiness. Uh, and then he, he says that actually he recalls reading Hortensius for its content rather than its form, okay, uh, which is a little bit of a slight deviation from his pursuit before. Remember, I taught you guys a new vocabulary word, loquacity, which basically means say a lot of words, but don't mean it, but really not making, you're not really saying anything, but it just sounds nice. And he was saying, well, you know, this book was kind of the opposite to me. It didn't really sound so nice, but the content of it was amazing. Okay. And it really sort of changed his life, changed his perspective. He said, okay, well, maybe I should pursue wisdom. And prior to that, he wasn't thinking about that. So it, it, it actually should make us think about this point for a second. It's very important. Look at what the effect of reading something, especially at an influence, like an influenceable age, can do. I'm sure you've seen it in your own lives. A book that you read in an important time in your life that had implications and changed the way you kind of looked at things. Uh, the point is, we have to read. We have to encourage uh, younger generations to read valuable writings that can change their hearts. If they read nothing, or read things that are non-Christian, we are missing a really a, a sort of once in a lifetime opportunity to win people to the kingdom of God. So I should think about that next time, you know, how, okay, how can I apply this practically in my life? You know, I should think about it the next time that I have an idea about a gift or an activity to do with someone who is maybe, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, even in college. Feed them things that will change their lives, you know? Uh, it's nice to maybe take my Sunday school kids out to eat or to hang out with them. And those things are good and you should do them. But uh, it might be a, a nice idea to think about a book that maybe changed you and affected you 
in your life. I mean, I, I remember as maybe when I was like, I don't know, 12 or 13, somebody told me about uh, Paradise of the Fathers or the Life of St. Anthony, I think. And, and I read Life of St. Anthony and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And it really changed how I looked at my faith because I found people who were really taking their faith in a, in a, in a serious way and their morality was uh, something that was, you know, you don't see in, 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 in everyday life. And, you know, really inspired me to try to do some of the things uh, that I would read about. And I'm sure all of you have stories like this, books that you read, things that you heard uh, that, that you got soaked into you and affected you deeply. So uh, consider this when you are thinking about how I can affect those around me and how I should affect myself, right? If I'm not reading anything, I don't have given, I'm not giving myself an opportunity uh, sort of to be changed. And some people, a lot of people consider this to be sort of St. Augustine's first conversion because it makes him fall in love with philosophy, which is going to be a big, big part of the rest of his life. Uh, so like I said, the book itself was a defense of the study of philosophy, and it encouraged readers to look for truth in whatever form it may take. So that was the main thing is like, you should look for truth no matter where it is. And so when he was, you know, him being sort of bright, sort of impressionable, uh, all of a sudden, and at the same time, he was feeling a little bit of spiritual emptiness. St. Augustine takes this like advice to heart. And he's like, okay, I'm going to pursue true wisdom. But Cicero, the author of the thing, was pagan, right? Uh, and because St. Augustine was raised Christian, kind of, by his mother, St. Augustine feels like, okay, you know what? I should look into my faith for answers. If I'm looking for truth, I should start with uh, maybe the faith that I was born into. Uh, his, if you remember, like I said, his education was about the spoken word, how to give fancy speeches, basically, how to be a good public defender. Um, and so when he starts, he starts to sort of try to read uh, the Bible. The Bible for him was simple and it was too sort of like uh, below his refined tastes, really. You know, he's used to reading like high philosophical arguments and the Bible for him is just like, oh, this is so simple. This is just a bunch of stories, uh, people doing things. It's funny because when you read them and you hear them say that, you know, a lot of us think, well, the Bible is pretty complicated, <laughs> you know, and we have a hard time understanding it. But uh, St. Augustine was like, actually, you know, the Bible was something that was very easy and very like, there's a bunch of parables about farmers and much stories about, uh, you know, giants and uh, Noah's Ark. And all. It's just very simple to him. And looking back, he concludes, he says, he was too intellectually conceited to see the complex meaning behind the simple words. Okay. He says, I was too intellectually conceited to see the complex meaning behind the simple words. So St. Augustine's dislike of sort of the plain spoken Christian Bible had some major consequences for his spiritual life because it, it sort of takes a turn here. He becomes attracted to a different faith that is kind of Christian, uh, but is a, a, a Christian heresy that we talked about in the past couple of weeks, Manichaeanism, because this, this heresy has more sort of refined and intellectual components to it. Okay, so he, he gets really attracted to them. And, you know, the, the, the sort of the take home message from this is that, you know, the Bible is how I, it, it all matters how I approach the Bible, right? So if I approach the Bible and say, you know what, these are a bunch of simple stories that don't affect me and it doesn't matter or I can't understand it or it's too hard or too easy or whatever, then I'm not going to benefit. And St. Augustine says, you know, I didn't benefit because I had the wrong attitude. I was kind of stuck up. I thought I knew what I was talking about and I thought the Bible was sort of like a really simple thing. And so this is sort of beneath me. And so later sort of in his life, he recognizes that no, actually I was the one who was in need uh, to be humbled. So before he starts attacking Manichaeanism directly, he talks about how he sought after God even when he was doing it incorrectly. If you remember in book one, when we first talked last week, he asked, what comes first, to know God or to seek him? And how can you seek God without knowing him? And so the, apparently the answer to that question is you can seek God without knowing him. And St. Augustine is proof of this, right? Even if you seek him incorrectly, if I'm seeking sincerely, he'll show himself. That's the conclusion that uh, St. Augustine comes to. That, you know, I'm, I'm now, I was, began this search. This search led me to this heresy. And even in, in, in leading me to this wrong thing, I ended up in the right place. And so he believes it doesn't matter if I sort of uh, don't know God, if I'm seeking him sincerely, God is going to reveal himself to me. And it's really just on me to sort of accept that. Uh, so St. Augustine has now 
uh, he goes and talks about the, the Manichaeism or the Manichae faith, and he talks about criticisms of it um, as opposed to sort of Christian belief. And those, it's important because some of the things that the, the Manichae, some of the heresies that they were prescribed to are some things that we still struggle with even today. You'll see when we, when we go through it. The first and most famous, oh, this reminds me, uh, I, sent a, I sent a study guide, uh, I think last Friday. So it has uh, the questions that I'm kind of hopefully trying to answer. Also, I think uh, the last couple questions in book four, I think were repeated from last week because I forgot to delete them. So I'm sorry about that. But I can send out a new one if it matters to anybody, if they don't want to have those on their clean piece of paper. Also, if any questions while I'm talking, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat and I'll, uh, and I'll try to get to them sort of at the end. So St. Augustine, he, talks, he starts talking about sort of three main primary criticisms of Manichaeanism. The first and most famous, I touched on it briefly, I think the first week, concerns the nature and the source of evil. You know, the, the Manichaeans, they say, if God is supremely good, if he is all powerful, if he is eternal, if he is the cause of all existence, how can evil exist? Where can it come from except from God? Or at the very least, why isn't God powerful enough to completely eliminate it? So the Manichaeans insisted that God then is not all powerful, that he's in fact in sort of this constant struggle against his opposite, against this dark, against this material world, that my nature is evil. And we talked a little bit, I think in the first week, so I don't want to go too much more detail about the answer to this question. And the answer comes in free will, uh, that God allows free will. And with free will, we make mistakes and do errors. But those things, God, of course, can stop, but he respects our free will and allows those things to exist. The second uh, challenge uh, or the second criticism of the Manichaean faith concerns the nature of God as a being. So actually the question is, is, is God confined within like a bodily form? Okay. Does he have hair? Does he have nails? And this question, by the way, is tied to the first question about evil because it challenges the idea that God is omnipotent. Okay. Or omnipresent in the, the view of the Manichaeans, God is limited. He's not everywhere and doesn't control everything. Okay, and so St. Augustine replies to this. He introduces like some of the same theological reasonings that we still use today. It's really cool. When you read this and you, you kind of think to yourself, wow, these are the same arguments that we make today about, about some of these things. Uh, simply put, he says that God is being itself, the most pure and supreme form of existence. Everything else is God's creation and fits into sort of this descending scale of being. The further something is from God, the less true existence it has. Okay, so things lower on the descending scale have, you know, greater temporality, greater general disorder. And basically, so the farther something away is from God, the more scattered, the more fleeting it is. Okay, heaven, not like the stars, but heaven, like the place, uh, is close to God and comes close to having this full, unchanging being. Human souls or minds are sort of a step further down and bodies and other material things are sort of on the lowest thing. So this idea allows actually St. Augustine to answer the question of being and the question of evil. He says, evil has no existence except as the deprivation of good, down to that level which is altogether without being. Okay, so basically in a nutshell, St. Augustine is saying evil is not something that can exist. It's not something that has its own existence, but it's the lack of God being good. Evil is just a name for the lack of true existence according to St. Augustine, a label for how far a thing or a person has wandered from the unity of, with God, okay? It's, I mean, it's the same arguments that we make even now about the question of evil and the question of God's omnipotence. It's helpful for us to remember here that, that how, what, what St. Augustine talked about last week with uh, when he stole the pear. You remember in book two, he stole the pear and he talked about how he tried to demonstrate that each sin was really a twisted or an incomplete attempt to do what? To be like God. Okay. So evil then is not some sort of dark substance that exists in conflict with God and is trying to like fight God, but it's just the extent to which something that is part of God's creation has turned away from God's creation, has turned away from him. In, in sort of like a, a significant sense, St. Augustine is saying there, there actually is no evil. Evil is not a thing to say that it exists. It's just, I turn away from God, and the farther I get away from God, it is, it's evil because it's not just because it's not good. It doesn't have its own existence. So this argument sort of depends on the recognition of, of, of God also as spirit, life of life, 
the condition for existence itself. God is being and goodness, right? And his creation is sort of in this hierarchy, like I was saying, with this good order. An order. Uh, the recognition of God as a spirit answers also the second thing that the criticism of Manichae, which concerns the statement, like in Genesis specifically, that man is made in God's image. So the Manichaeans had a problem with this. How could man be made in God's image unless God is somehow bodily? Okay, so that's what they thought. Well, if we're made in his image and we have bodies, then God must have some sort of body. Okay. And so Sir Angasin says, no, that, that the scripture refers to God as spirit and man is, uh, and, and, and man is capable of finding the spirit of God within himself. So God doesn't need to be uh, bodily or corporeal to explain the statement of Genesis. And God is not some sort of infinite mass, some kind of substance that extends in all directions to infinity, anything like that. So it seems like sort of a, a strange belief, but the idea was God has to be some sort of uh, thing in the sense like it has to be, it has to be like a physical thing. Um, and St. Augustine says, no, it doesn't have to be that. The third challenge, which I think is also something that is like super relevant um, to nowadays. And I think a lot of us as Christians have issues with St. Augustine, he goes uh, to starts talking about um, the rejection of the book of Genesis and a lot of the Old Testament. The, the Manichaeans actually ridiculed how much like polygamy there was in the Old Testament, how much animal sacrifice, they were very against animal sacrifice. So all the animal sacrifice that was part of the Bible, um, they found those things sort of in conflict with God's laws that were set out elsewhere in the Bible. Okay, so St. Augustine responds to this argument that while God's law is by definition eternal and unchanging, it reveals itself to humans by degrees and manifests itself differently according to historical context. So he says that there's a difference between true inward justice, which could be found by finding God inside of oneself, and relative justice, which serves like everyday human world. And he makes, actually, I would really encourage you if you didn't read the book, to go back, especially to this section, um, when he talks about the Old Testament, he talks about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you know, because I'm sure a lot of you think about, well, how come it's okay for Abraham to have uh, more than one wife, or Isaac to have more than one, or Jacob to have more than one wife, and it's not okay for an example for me to have more than one wife, or for you to have more than one husband. Why do, does, does God's morality change? He makes really convincing arguments about why the Old Testament people were not, in fact, evil. It's at, here, here's what he says, I'll, I'll put a small quote. He says, yet in one and the same person on a single day and in the same house, they may see one action fit for another mem one member to perform and another action fitting for another. What has been allowed during a long period is not permitted one hour later. An act allowed or commanded in one corner is forbidden and subject to punishment if done in an adjacent corner. Does that mean that justice is liable to variation and change? No. The times which it rules over are not identical for the simple reason that they are times, but the grasp of human beings is not competent to harmonize cause and effect valid in earlier ages among other nations of which they have no experience. So in common language, St. Augustine is saying, what is okay to do today might not be okay to do yesterday. And that's because yesterday is different than today. I mean, think about even what we're doing with, dealing with now, right? Is it, is it inherently wrong to get into a group of 50 people. No, but if I were to have a group of 50 people at my house today, the cops might come and say, what are you doing, right? Because there's a quarantine and you're not supposed to do that. So what's the difference? The time, right? Now it's unacceptable, but uh, two months ago, it was fine. So St. Augustine makes that argument. He says, the times have changed. And because the time has changed, there are different rules that that happens in every he says that happens in every facet of life why would it be any different with god it's not that god has changed it's that the people and the times and the historical context has changed so it's important for us to remember that when we think about the old time. he also says something else too he says like if a king makes a makes a law that never existed before as soon as that law exists it should be followed or if the king uh, takes away a law that was existing before, as soon as he takes it away, there is no longer a need for it to be followed. How much, and he says, and when we do this, no one questions anything, right? So like if, if the president comes out tomorrow and, and makes a law, we follow the law. Maybe yesterday we didn't follow it, but today we follow it because now it's a law. 
And so St. Augustine says the same thing. He says, isn't God free and capable and, 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 and have the authority to, to do the same? If he makes a law tomorrow, then tomorrow I follow it. And maybe if I didn't follow it yesterday because yesterday was not a law. And that doesn't make the people in the Old Testament unrighteous. It makes them uh, a part of a different time that was under a different law because they were different uh, periods of time. The other thing that he mentions that I really liked uh, in this chapter is when he, he categorizes different sins. He, uh, he says that there are sins, this, this especially was my favorite part, he says, there are sins of those who are making progress. By the criterion of perfection, good judges have to condemn them, but they are to be encouraged with praise in hope of fruit. So he's saying not everybody who is sinning is on equal footing. If I'm struggling in sin, and maybe I've been bothered by sin for, for a long time, and I'm struggling against it, and I'm making progress, even if I fall, yes, by strict accounts, I am not perfect, and I, and I should be condemned. And, you know, if I'm talking about modern days and how I should live my life, my spiritual father, on some level, should condemn me for the things I do wrong. But at the same time, he should encourage them too. He says, but they are to be encouraged with praise and hope of fruit. So it's a nice, uh, I'm sure St. Augustine said this speaking from his own experience. Uh, a person who lived a life that St. Augustine lived, I'm sure did not turn it around in an instant. I'm sure there were battles and struggles for him uh, as he was uh, navigating sort of his new calling as a, as, a, as a Christian, someone whose faith was important to him. And so he says, yes, there needs to be some condemnation in the sense that yes, things are not perfect. But the condemnation has come along with encouragement, that there is hope, that there is praise, that there is some sort of fruit coming at the end of the tunnel. So at the end of uh, book three is another very, very significant turning point for, for St. Augustine. It's a description of a vision that his mom, St. Monica, had at this point in Augustine's life. She's standing on this sort of like really long, uh, narrow strip or platform or whatever, and she meets a stranger. And the stranger tells him, uh, she is, or she tells the strangers that she's distraught over her son's refusal to be a good Christian. So in the dream, she's saying to this guy, I'm really sad, I'm really worried, I'm really distraught because my son uh, is kind of going on a wrong direction. The stranger tells her in the dream, he says, where, where you are, there he will be also. And then Monica turns uh, to find St. Augustine standing behind her on the platform. And then she wakes up. So she goes, she tells uh, St. Augustine in this dream, she says, I had this good dream and it, it's really nice. And, it, and she takes it sort of like a good omen. And then she, she goes to the priest, so she begs a local priest to try to convert Augustine. Because remember, he's, a, he, he has, he's part of this maniche uh, heresy right now. The priest actually refuses. He says, Augustine is not ready yet. But he says, as you live, it cannot be that the son of these tears should perish. St. Augustine uses the story to, to remind the people that are reading, to remind us, that despite all of his errors, uh, God has a plan or had a plan for his salvation. And his plan was executed partly through the prayers of St. Monica. It's interesting, he talks about, so St. Monica told St. Augustine, here's, here's the dream, and I want you to change, and I want you to convert, or whatever. And uh, St. Augustine argues with her, and he says, you know, well, in the dream, the guy said that um, where he is, you know, that you should be too. And, may, and so maybe this means that you need to come be uh, a maniche like I am. And she responds to him, she says, no, actually the man in the dream was very specific. He said, where you are, there will he be also. And, and, she, and he at first sort of was like, at the time he says in the, in the book at the time, he sort of ignores this and he's kind of like, oh, whatever. Uh, but now he looks at it and says, yes, it was very specific. The dream was very specific saying that he would eventually come to him, come to his mother rather than uh, the other way around. Okay, so when you look at, that was, that's essentially book three. Uh, book four, he returns back to his hometown, right? Remember, he was in Carthage for uh, training to be a lawyer uh, or to be a sort of orator or like a speaker, public defender. Uh, and now St. Augustine, Saint Augustine, Augustine comes back to his hometown, to Thagasti. Uh, he begins to teach, actually to teach rhetoric like he learned. And he makes friends and he's chasing his career along the way. And he points out actually, he spends his public hours, like his time in the day, in pursuit of what he looks at now as empty worldly goals, right? His, he has an ambition to have public office, 
uh, which, you know, needs a lot of skill and, and needs to be able to speak well and, and needs a lot of contacts and needs a lot of money and all that kind of thing. And then in his private time, sort of at night, he's pursuing this false religion, Manichaeanism, right? And so he's living this hypocritical life. Why does he call it hypocritical life? Because the Manichaeans are against anything that has to do with the material world. So the fact that he's trying to gain position, get wealthy, gain things is going against sort of the religion that he claims to follow. So he's saying he calls it a hypocritical life. He says, this hypocritical life in which I brought, I sought to both material gain and false spiritual purity. And he says, this was nothing but a form of self-destruction. He calls it self-destruction. He, he regrets sort of his time as a, as a teacher of rhetoric because he calls himself a, a salesman. A career, he has a career as a salesman. And he uses tricks of rhetoric. Um, and he talks about his in persistence in keeping this concubine, keeping this lady that he's living with, but not married to. He never says anything too much about her uh, sort of in this book, um, but she stayed with Augustine for about 10 years. And eventually uh, they have a son together, Adiatus, who he dies when he's 17 years old. So in St. Augustine, he does remember making some progress towards truth. So one of the things he figures out, and he says in the book, he says that he concludes that astro astrology is bogus. He says it is utterly bogus. And this is like a, a, actually a, a first step in getting rid of the, the Manichae heresy that he was following. Because the, the Manichae heresy has a number of really kind of bizarre accounts about heavenly bodies. And he sort of gets rid of this uh, or, or finds this stuff to be false now. Uh, and because they had like a lot of things where they predict things and they have sort of rituals that accompany that. And St. Augustine uh, began to sort of attribute this occasional success of them being right and being able to predict things as, you know, this is just chance. Of course, they're gonna be, you know, if you flip a coin, you're gonna be right half the time, uh, even if you have no idea what you're talking about. And so um, he, he realizes that astrology is wrong. He explains also why astrology is wrong, which I thought was really cool. You know, maybe as you were growing up or, or maybe this is the first time, but I can just tell you now that the church is against those kind of things. The church is against astrology. The church is against like uh, palm readings, all that kind of like psychic, uh, all those kind of things. The church warns uh, its, uh, its sons and daughters not to take part in those things. So then, you know, the question is like, why? Well, why do we, why shouldn't we do those things? Uh, a lot of people are like, well, these are fun, and it's like, it's just whatever, and it's just something cool to do. So why does the church tell us not to do it? The church tells us not to do it because, just because, you know, church doesn't want us to have fun, or why doesn't the church say that we could do this? Why does it say we shouldn't do this? Besides the fact, of course, that it's just simply not true, those things are not real, there's another reason that St. Augustine brings up in this chapter that is an important reason why uh, we shouldn't take part in things like astrology. He says, uh, he says that astrologers try to destroy the entire doctrine of salvation when they say the reason for your sinning is determined by heaven and Venus or Saturn or Mars was responsible for this act. They make a man not in the least responsible for his fault, but mere flesh and blood and putrid pride so that the blame lies with the creator and order of the heaven and stars. So what is he saying? St. Augustine is saying, if I, you know, read palms, have my palm read, or if I look at the stars or I read my horoscope, and it says something about me, it says, you know, you're going to do this, or this is going to happen, or you're going to feel like this, or you're this type of, you know, the horoscopes always say like, oh, you're, you know, I'm a cancer, so I'm a, you're a cancer, so that means you're blah, 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 so like, so then, so then it's okay, well, I'm this because I was created that way, and whose fault is that? The creator. Who is that? God. So essentially now I'm attributing blame to God for my faults, right? I'm saying those things that are wrong in my life or the things that I do, I do because I was born on a certain day or the stars aligned that way or because the psychic read my palm and my palm is this long, the vein in my palm or the crack in my palm is this long, right? So instead of blaming myself or praising myself for behavior, I, I leave it up to, to God and I say, God is the one who did those things or I was created this way and this is why it's happening and it has nothing to do with my own uh, will and my own decision. One thing that finally convinced uh, St. Augustine, how did he come to this conclusion that astrology was fake or it wasn't good or it was utterly bogus, like he said. 
he meets this guy named Helvius. Helvius was a doctor who had previously studied astrology. And he told him, you know, you're studying astrology as a hobby. You're studying it because you think it's cool, you think it's fascinating, you think it's fun, and, you know, your religion sort of tells you about it. Um, but I actually studied it as a career. I wanted to be the people who predicted things. And when I studied it, the deeper I studied it, I found that I couldn't continue because it simply wasn't true. He said astrology was right, like I said before, just the same thing like any prediction could be right, just by mere chance. And so because... He, he actually he says the words in the, in the book. He says that like, you study this as a hobby, but I studied this as a career. So trust me, I, st I know it. I've studied it more than you. This is not real. This is not good. This is not something that is going to be helpful for you. And that is what uh, sort of gets him to be able to um, be able to sort of overcome the, the false thing about astrology. So then in the middle of the chapter, we see a really nice story. Uh, St. Augustine tells us a story about one of his friends, Nebridius. Okay. His friend Nebridius is the best friend, his best friend at the time, and he gets sick. Okay. He describes Nebridius, he says he's a good and chaste man, who also actually, by the way, thought astrology was ridiculous. So one of the other people that sort of convinced him that astrology was not the not not true. He says, I had turned him away from the true faith, to which, being only young, he had no strong or profound allegiance towards these superstitions and pernicious mythologies, which were the reason for my mother's tears over me. So he says, you know, he was, he was Christian, but he was young and he's influenced, you know, uh, easily influenced. And so I influenced him and I actually convinced him to be a Manichae. Um, he made him a follower of Manichaeanism, um, but it's actually something really interesting happened. Uh, Nebridius gets sick, okay? And while he's sick, he has a really high fever and he's really near death. And because of this, his family, comes, has him baptized while he's unconscious. Okay, he's not even conscious, he has him baptized. And if you remember from last week, I told you that people would be baptized very close to their death uh, so that they could sort of, the thought was, if I can be baptized right before I die, I will die sinless. And so I can enter into the heavenly kingdom. So I should be baptized as close to death as possible. So they, his family came and while he was sort of in a coma or unconscious, he was baptized. And then, you know, he actually got better. And so he, he got a little bit better and then he met or St. Augustine assumed when he would meet him that he would stick to his Manichaean beliefs and that they could laugh and joke together uh, about his baptism. So St. Augustine actually, because because by the way, the Manichaeans don't, didn't believe in baptism. They thought baptism was ridiculous. You don't need that. And so he kind of starts joking about his baptism to, to Nebridius. But Nebridius actually has none, none of this. He's like completely changed. He said that he wouldn't accept that sort of conversation anymore if he wanted to be, continue to be his friend. You're going to have to stop making jokes about my faith and about my baptism. As St. Augustine sort of is contemplating this really weird, strange turn of events, Nebridius gets sick again, and after a few days, uh, he dies. And, and St. Augustine says, you took the man from this life when our friendship had scarcely completed a year. It had been sweet to me beyond the sweetness of life. So he was saying basically, you know, this was something so valuable to me this is going to be, this was something I was thought was going to last forever, something that was going to be an important my, part of my life for a long time. And then all of a sudden it's gone. All of a sudden it's taken away from me. This is another very huge turning point in the life of St. Augustine. Okay. Realizing now that his grief would have been alleviated by faith in God, St. Augustine concludes that actually his grief had become in and of itself a problem. Why? Because he is attached to transient things, things of the world instead of God. And because of this, he suffered grief when they disappeared. And he talks about this actually for a long time in this chapter. He talks about how things of the world are unreliable or transient. You know, like we say in the Catholic Epistle, do not love the world, do not things of the world, for the world is passing away in all its desires. He learns this in a really real and concrete way when his best friend um, sort of is suddenly taken away from him. He says that misery is due to an unreasonable attachment to mortal things. And he says that this is always the state of the soul without God. Misery is everywhere when there is nothing eternal to depend on. That's what he says. Misery is everywhere when there is nothing eternal to depend on. And St. Augustine goes, where should I go to escape from myself? Wherever the human soul turns itself other than you, it is fixed in sorrows. 
it's amazing. Like he comes to this conclusion after losing his friend that there is nowhere to go that's going to make me happy except God. Why? And because remember, he's really into philosophy. Why? Because everything that is temporary, I eventually will lose. And if I lose it, it will hurt. But if I cling to God, who is eternal, I will never lose him. He will never lose me. And I will never be hurt. And I will always be happy. So actually, this uh, death affects him so much that he can't even stay in his hometown anymore. He's like, I got to move. I got to get out of here. Too many memories of death. So he moves actually back to Carthage. His state of the point, his state of mind at this point was not really good, but he learned a lot of lessons and the grief was still with him. The biggest lesson, like I said, was this idea of transience, that everything material, no matter how beautiful, no matter how amazing it is, has a beginning and an end, okay? So they shouldn't be the object of love. It's an amazing uh, conclusion to come to when you're a very young person. Can you imagine? He's probably still in his 20s and he comes to this conclusion that, you know what? The things that are in the world are not like the most important things they go away. They can get taken away in an instant. So because he had this lesson, he was able to sort of start the wheels turning in his mind to lean or to go towards God. He says, God, on the other hand, is a place of undisturbed quietness. Nothing can disturb the, the relationship or my place with God. The, the things of the world could pass away and they are part of uh, uh, sort of things that are transient. But God, if he is really eternal, then temporality shouldn't be a concern. So this is something that's important to him. Finally, in that chapter towards the end, he talks about a book that he wrote. He actually wrote a book called uh, Things That Are Beautiful and Fitting, The Beautiful and the Fitting. And the book that he writes is talking about two kinds of beauty, beauty that's inherent in the thing itself and beauty by virtue of the thing's value or the thing that, that it can be that it can use and he actually makes a lot of retractions so he, he wrote the book a few years ago and now he's writing saying here are things that were messed up about the book that i wrote uh first the thing that he thought was messed up about the book that he wrote was he dedicated the book to this guy named Herius, who was a roman speaker and he says i actually don't even know Herius. i only dedicated my work to him because he was popular he said i used to love people based on human judgment not your judgment my god so he, just because he thought, you know, he knew other people thought the person was cool, so he dedicated the book to him, but he didn't really know him. Uh, St. Augustine also argued in the book that there is evil as a substance, right? And we talked about that's probably because he wrote it when he was a man manichae, and uh, he, he recognizes um, now that those things are wrong. St. Augustine considers his second era, this thing about evil, to be an amazing madness. And he talks about even the soul, he now knows, is not in itself the fundamental truth or good. It participates in God, but is not itself God or a small piece of God. So he's making all these retractions about this book, uh, which is uh, which is an interesting thing because uh, you'll see this as a theme even in St. Augustine's other writings. He has a whole book dedicated to things he wrote before that are mistakes that he wants to fix. So it's nice to, to see St. Augustine to be the type of person that was very reflective, type of person that is willing uh, to look back at his life and say, you know what, I thought I was going the right direction, but I really kind of wasn't. So and I think that's an important skill for us to learn too. You know, if we're always, if we always think we're always right, you know, I can never grow. If I think the way I deal with my friends is always right, I can never grow. If I think the, we're, the way I deal with my significant other is right, I can never grow. There's gotta be times I'm wrong, right? And so if there's times I'm wrong, I need to own them. I need to look at them in a, in a, in a, in a real and, and, and serious way for me to change. I can't do that if uh, everything I do sort of is right or in my eyes is right. The last thing is he talks about uh, reading this other book called Categories. Uh, this book, Categories by Aristotle, it's also a philosophy, a philosophy book. And he talks about how everything is sort of uh, put into categories. Uh, categories were of, of value, of worth, of beauty, of magnitude. And so he's trying to say, well, where does God fit into this, to this book? And actually, uh, people argued, was Aristotle, was Aristotle talking about including the divine in this book or not? And so he comes to the conclusion that God actually is his own type of beauty. He says, you, God, yourself are your own magnitude and your own beauty. So why is this important to him? Why does he even include this? You know, it's kind of weird that he includes this is because St. Augustine gets into these problems of trying to imagine God because he had this ma manic belief that God is this human, like huge, big body that I have to actually see uh, or actually that, that exists in a, in a physical world. And he, he talks later, he says, 
like a luminous body of immense size and myself a bit of that body. What extraordinary perversity. So he recognizes now that it's perverse, but it was important at the time that he sees that for what it is. So that is, uh, those are books uh, three and four of St. Augustine's Confessions. Uh, we learned a lot about like sort of St. Augustine and his life and, and, and the things that he was doing. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the, in the group chat or send them to me uh, privately. Otherwise, uh, we will go ahead and pray. I'll give you guys maybe like a 30 seconds or a minute for questions. And then if you don't have any questions, you guys don't have to leave because I think you guys have like games and things like that. Actually, uh, maybe do you have any, do we need any instructions or anything that we need to say for the games, uh, whoever is planning the games? Um, I'm going to send out a link to the Google form. And so essentially what's going to happen is whoever's in here and wants to play, we'll put you guys into groups. Um, and then with your group, you're going to answer the trivia questions on the Google form and then you'll be awarded points. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so let's see. I don't see any questions, so we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and pray. So for next week, uh, we're going to read, uh, God willing, chapters uh, five and six. Uh, and like I said, on like I was in the past couple of weeks, on maybe on Friday or so, I'll send out uh, a study guide. I hope you guys are uh, using the study guide or you're even going, after, going to the study guide after to fill it in because if you keep all those together, you'll sort of have an idea about sort of what is St. Augustine's Confessions about. Uh, if you don't, you'll be like, well, those are maybe a couple of okay lectures that Abuna Theodore said, but I don't remember anything about anything. So it's nice to have those so that you can look back and, and understand sort of the important points of St. Augustine's uh, Confessions. All right, we'll go ahead and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this example of repentance, the example of a life seeking you, uh, we thank you for having someone like St. Augustine to, to look up to, someone who was seeking you, but maybe not in the right ways. We ask you, God, for all of us here who are seeking you, whether we're seeking you right now in earnest, whether we are seeking you sincerely, whether we're seeking you in a wrong way or seeking you out in the wrong places, that you guide us back to you, that you help us to, to find you, because we know that it is your will for us not to die but to return and to repent and to live. We ask you, God, to grant us this life of repentance and to turn towards you once again through the intercessions of St. Mary and St. Verena. Hear us when you pray, thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Have fun uh, at your game, and we'll see you guys next week. All right, guys. Um, so if you want to stick around for trivia, um, go ahead and stay in here, and then um, I'll get all that set up and sent to you guys in just a second. Actually, I'll send the link in the chat. Okay, so I just sent you guys the link to the trivia. Okay, and you should see an invite link to join the trivia rooms. Do you guys see that? Yes, no, maybe, anyone? Yeah, I see the breakout room, but I don't see the, the doc. Uh, I sent it in the chat. Oh, the chat, that, that's not me, okay.
can you actually send it on WhatsApp also? Yeah, sure. There you go. Okay, so um, originally I had planned to do a PowerPoint, um, but it won't let me actually show the PowerPoint during the breakout groups. So I'm going to um, send you guys messages to your groups with the questions. And then one person from each group is going to fill out the form. So you guys can decide on who wants to do that. Peter, I'm gonna move you to a different group because you're the only one that's participating in your group. There you go. Hey Mary, I don't know what happened to my thing. I clicked it and came back and then, I don't know. Okay, are you in a group? I'm in the main thing. You're in the main thing, okay. So I'll move you to a group. Okay. And then you need to click join. Didn't send me anything. Um, weird. Should I leave and join again? Yeah. Okay. And then Shaggy, I need to put you in a group too. All right, guys, so is everyone in a group now? All right, I think it's just Shaddy that's not. Just wait a minute for him. Wait, so I can't actually see you guys anymore, but you should be able to see each other, I think, in the chat. So or in your breakout groups. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste the questions into the message and then one person from each group if you guys could answer it on the google form that would be amazing okay so this is question one round one entertainment Did you guys all get the question? All right, question two. Question three. I'll write it out. 